All right, back here on the barn, the Ben America Radio Network, and uh, pleased to uh, go down to the uh, Portland metropolitan area, my old stomping grounds, and uh, welcome in a, a writer as uh, books like The Motel Life, Lean on Pete, The Free, North Line, and his newest book, Don't Skip Out on Me, now available from Harper Perennial. He's also a longtime singer, songwriter of Richmond Fontaine, and the uh, is it the Delines or the Delines? Willie Vlotten, our guest. Uh, it's the Delines. Delines, okay. Because I, 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 I got to admit, I was a Richmond Ta- Fontaine fan, but I never heard the Delines music at all. So I, I guess I just never learned the pronunciation on that one. Yeah, yeah. It's more. It's like a, uh, it's led by a, a woman named Amy Boone, uh, uh, a singer out of Austin, Texas. It's a country soul uh, kind of ballad band. Oh, right on. It's really fun. I, I write a lot of the tunes, but I kind of hide in the back, and, and it's just so much fun to. Uh, being a band with a good singer for a change. I was going to say, I would think that for, like, I, I had a band all through college and I was the singer, and there is an added pressure that comes with being the singer songwriter. I would think it would be great to just be able to chill in the back and play guitar. It is, believe me. I could do, you know, like touring with Fresh and Fontaine, I always felt, and I don't have a good voice, that good a voice. I mean, I have a, I, I'm good enough to get through, mm-hmm. but, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, it wears you out after a while. Just the, uh, Worrying about the, the their your songs and you're singing uh, that you're letting the guys down by you just being you or your the way you write songs. Uh, maybe you're letting every, the guys down. Maybe if there was a better singer, we would do better. That idea that always w- weighed hard on me uh, with Fontaine and 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 with the lines. You know, she's good. everybody loves her voice because she's just good. And uh, so I don't worry about anything. I just try not to mess up. And um. And it's fun. So, yeah, it is the most fun I've ever had uh, being in a band. The the other thing that people forget sometimes, the important part of being the singer is you're in charge of between-song banter with the uh, with the crowd, which I know some singers are really good at and some are terrible at it. Yeah, I mean, I, I can I can talk to, uh, for weeks <laughs> but uh, in between songs, but uh, but I don't know if I'm <laughs> I don't know if I'm any good at it. I think you'd have to ask the other guys in the band, and they'd probably all want to strangle me. Uh, so I don't know. I know uh, I know you've been doing events uh, on the road in Europe the last couple of weeks. Are, are you just doing readings? Are you doing music? Or are you doing kind of a combination of both right now? It was it was to promote the book, Don't Skip Out on Me. Mm-hmm. And the book came with a, a soundtrack okay. um, that, that Rich and Fontaine did. And... Um, uh, so I, when I toured in in Europe, I would do events that would be songs. Uh, uh, I would read, and then um, I travel with a pedal steel player, and then there would be question and uh, question and answers interviews and stuff. So it was kind of a combination kind of gigs, but they went off well. I was I was uh, surprised. Do you have uh, have have favorite stops in Europe? I mean, they're they're all they're all really fun. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I've always liked Ireland. But really, uh, some about that place just kills me. And um, uh, but anywhere, you know, I, on this run, I got to go to Amsterdam and uh, Stockholm, Sweden, and London. So I got to go to some cool places. And Scotland's always so beautiful. So uh, it's just lucky, you know. I never traveled before before being in a band. I never got out of the United States before being in a band. So uh, uh, it's it's all lucky. When a uh, when a book goes out to print and and, and kind of goes out into the world, do you ever go back and read your books again, or spend time with the characters in your head, or or do you just kind of, you know, hey, it's out there, it's it's in the world, they can do with it whatever they want. I mean, I always hang out. I, I write strictly, generally for me. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so uh, the characters all means a lot to me. So I'll never reread the book because I don't want to see the flaws that I uh, in it that I didn't see when I was writing it mm-hmm. I mean I think your aesthetics change as you get older or change uh, in between books or you fall out of the love of the world you you were in when you were writing the book and you've moved on to something else so your you, your vision of your stuff changes and so I, n- I never want to go back because I don't want to find out that it was I made a bunch of mistakes or I just wasn't that good at it but the characters are I always they're always around. I, they're like little saints to me that uh, they, uh, that I keep around that help me out from time to time. 
It's funny. I had a very similar experience. Like by the time I finished my book, I remember thinking like in the early phase, like, oh, I can't wait to read this. Like as a hard copy book. And by the time it came out, like I didn't want anything. <laughs> I didn't want to read it at all. And, and the other thing I often hear from writers, and I hear this from musicians a lot too. Like, you know, they they say the book is never done, the album's never done. It just comes out whenever it comes out because you could theoretically sit and tinker with it forever. Yeah, and some writers do. I mean, uh, uh, some writers do go back in and never can let stuff go. I mean, the way I look at it is like uh, if I'm in love with it at one point, like if at one point, like if it's pretty tight and I really like it and I've worked really hard, as hard as I can, and it's not keeping me up at night, and I and I start, I call it cheating. I start like daydreaming about writing another story while I'm still finishing tinkering on the, the previous one. Mm -hmm. Then I know it's, time to go uh then i know the book's almost done so uh i get to a place where I, I i'm in love with it and then when i'm in when i'm there and i know i've done as much work as i can then i then i jump out um um and but yeah it's tough i mean it's it, it's tough to ever look back uh at, at what you're what you've worked on four years ago or six years ago because you're a different person and, yeah. and what you think is cool now you might not have thought was cool back then so, and what you're interested back then is might not be anything you're interested in now. So it's hard to judge your, yourself that way. And so I, I just I, I put my head back in the sand and, and move forward. Speaking of the characters, uh, your third book, uh, Lean on Pete, the uh, feature film coming out here uh, at the end of next month. And I've talked about it on the show just because I talked about doing the, uh, the voiceovers for it. But um, I would think it would be a little weird... To have, cause, cause a movie basically puts visuals to all the characters, or at least, you know, the, the director's version of it. And I, I would think that would be strange. Like, have you seen Lean on Pete and do the characters kind of match, uh, your initial vision when you wrote the book or is it quite a bit different? Well, yeah, I have seen the movie. I think it's a beautiful movie. Mm -hmm. Um, it reminds me of, uh, uh, there's a movie called Kez by, uh, Ken Loach, uh, a, a movie from the, I think it was late 60s, 70s. A beautiful, really beautiful movie. So yeah, I I really like it. Um, you know, it's it is different. It is different, and um, th they combine a, a few characters become one character, mm -hmm. or they cut out. You know, they have to cut out large sections of the yeah. of the book just to make it to make it work. So uh, so that's a that was a big job. Andrew Haig, I thought, did a, a really good job on that front of deciding what to leave it and what to take out. Um, but yeah, it is. It's odd. The only guy that that made sense to me is uh, uh, Foley was the trainer. Uh, mm -hmm. Steve Buscemi seemed like a, a trainer at Portland Meadows. Uh, <laughs> uh, he seemed like two or three guys kind of melted into one. Um, so he 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 looked right at home there. Uh, but the other people, that, you know, I, I've seen him in other movies, so it's hard. It's hard to and. But with him, there's something about his face that makes you think he could be a trainer there. You know, I. Uh... I sat with him and Bob and Terry Beckner uh, when we were shooting that night, and he was so inquisitive to Bob and Terry about, you know, what, what, what would a trainer say in this situation? What would he be thinking? You know, and, and it was really neat to see him just generally so inquisitive. And then when he found out I was the race caller, he starts asking me about names and he, he was just, uh, it, it was so interesting. Cause you know, I mean, he's, he's probably a 60 year old guy and he was just, he had the exuberance uh, of a young kid. It was really uh, fascinating to see. And, um, what was so neat was I had to do some secondary voiceovers. And so I actually got to see a lot of the uh, more finalized clips and you're right. I mean, you know, he, he uses a lot of the racetrack nomenclature and I just love that it was actually at Portland Meadows because the book took place there. Uh, I remember five years ago showing you and Andrew around the place and when he had yeah, flown over. You were very nice. Yeah. <laughs> and so it was just cool to see that kind of all come together. It's uh, I'm really excited to see the movie. I actually was at a theater a couple of weeks ago and the, uh, the preview came on and there's a little part where, where, uh, where I say, you of the, the start of the race and uh, <laughs> I'm sitting there with my sister and she's like that was you that was you <laughs> going crazy oh that's cool yeah it was uh, it was really a, a pretty neat deal Willie Vlatton our guest here on the Abed America Radio Network so you grew up in uh, in Reno, Nevada I have a number of friends who grew up in Vegas and they've explained to me how strange it is to kind of have because you you very much live a normal life outside of this little weird bubble that's going on in, uh, in downtown was Reno kind of like that for you uh, growing up? Yeah, growing up, I mean, I, I lived I lived like four miles outside of downtown, and uh, so you know, my mom hated casinos, uh, uh, except for the the food specials. Like once in a while, they you know there was certain casinos that had good food, and then 
it, you know, at certain hours they would cut their prices. Uh, and so we would go for that. Uh, but never, uh, she was really anti gambling and she worked with a lot of guys that either had gambling problems or alcohol problems. And, you know, Reno attracted like Vegas attracts, uh, gamblers and, and drinkers, uh, mm-hmm. Uh, so that that segment meant nothing to me until I, you know, I was like seventeen, eighteen, and then I started f- feeling like that. I st- those kind of guys, those kind of drifter guys that were around Reno all the time and living in the motels around Reno, uh, made sense to me for some reason. Um, and so I started kind of hanging out in uh, in on around downtown, and and that's how. You know, I I first started gambling on um, 21, like 21 and roulette, Mm -hmm. you know, and I cashed my paycheck every Friday. I cashed my paycheck at this casino because they gave you a free breakfast. And back then they just gave you like a stack of drinks. If you flirted with the old lady, she would give you up to 12 drinks. And so you'd have your $200 and 12 drinks and a free breakfast. And, um, you know, I started, you know, it didn't happen a lot, but I lost paychecks, a couple paychecks. And. Um, and you know, I was making, like I said, 220 bucks or whatever a week. So I was not doing great by any stretch of imagination. And then I would lose whole checks. And so that's how I started betting horses. Cause, uh, you know, you can, you can bet 20 bucks and that can last you all day betting horses if, if, if you have discipline to you. And, uh, and then I also, I started cashing my, my check in a, at a bank and staying clear of the Friday night casino, uh, you know, free check and I mean, free breakfast, drink, check cash, and <laughs> yeah, the ba- the ba- <laughs> we uh that I got got into. So, so that's how I got into betting horses. Really, it was off track betting parlors in in Reno. My uh my first job in racing was at Emerald Downs, and we used to get paid every other Friday, and they would let you cash your check right on the main the main betting line. And uh, I didn't find that out until about midway through the season. But once I did, I, I had one one time where I, I blew, blew the whole check by. I, th- I got paid Friday, lost about half Friday night, and then the other half Saturday. And I was just like, "Well, this 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 isn't going to work out very well." Yeah. And, and I came back a, uh, like a, a couple of years later after I'd started announcing. They uh, they asked me to host the. Uh, the morning of the Long Acres Mile, they were doing like they kind of did like a tailgating party show, and like Lafitte Pinkai sure. came out, and like all these other guests. So it was really cool. And so I remember they paid me four hundred bucks, and she comes and she comes with the envelope, and she goes, "Hey, here's your uh, your money." And I said, "Okay, great." And so I look, and it's it's two two hundred dollar vouchers. <laughs> Oh, wow. And I go, that's cruel. I know. And I go, well, I either got to go cash these or, and so I ended up making uh, about $80 for that, for that. Oh, that's good. Because I gave back about 320 of it. But, uh, yeah, Yeah. the the next year I told her, I said, look, I need a check. (laughs) I need it not to be in, uh, in in voucher form. But so did you go, uh, straight from Reno to Portland? Was Portland your next stop? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm not that adventurous. I lived in, uh, uh, Reno to I was twenty six, twenty seven, and then and then I wanted to get in a in a like a like a, a real band, mm-hmm. like a working band, and I couldn't do that. I couldn't figure out how to do that in Reno, so I uh, um, so I moved to Portland, which had a big like indie rock scene. So I, I I worked for a trucking company, and they transferred me out to Portland. And then when I was in Portland, I was so homesick for Reno. Uh, I didn't know what to do, and I wanted to. I was always wanting to move back to Reno and. So I started hanging out. I found they had a horse track, and I started hanging out there because it reminded me of, of Reno. And and then uh, and then I just started writing novels out there. I spent you know four four days four nights a week, out there maybe, uh, you know. Uh, so it just became like my favorite place to to be. The uh, the music scene when you came out because I'm assuming you guys kind of got started in the early mid '90s and obviously that was kind of after the big Seattle explosion but there was also kind of a little Portland explosion like Everclear and uh, some other bands I was thinking maybe like Elliot Smith was he around when you were guys were kind of getting started Yeah I mean he was in a band called Heat Miser there was like Heat Miser Pond Cracker Bash uh, uh, were like pretty big bands. I think Everclear came on a little later, but yeah, there was just tons of bands and tons of places to play. Um, it was, you know, being from Reno or just playing ri- original music was tough to yeah. find a place to play. Uh, you go, you come up here and there's literally hundreds of bands doing it, and um, uh, so yeah, it was it was really really fun and 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 
you know, it was a lucky break for me to pick pick Portland. Well, because yeah, like I, uh, I'm a big fan of the Killers, and they talk about Vegas. They said when you're starting out, they don't want you to play original music. Like everywhere in Vegas wants you to play covers, and, and Reno's probably a little bit of the same of that, right? Yeah, and I was never good at like uh, that. I mean, and I grew up at the tail end when when casino bands, like when I was in high school, some of my guys I played with in high school, their dads played in casino bands and floor show bands and and made decent livings off it. Uh, Mm -hmm. And that started all kind of going away by the time I was in my early 20s. You know, no one was going out to see casino bands. A lot of the floor show music was just, you know, piped in. Uh, so, so you were more, you just had to be kind of like a bar band. So in Reno to make it, you know, there was a couple bands that could do all right, but you, you, and generally you had to be, you know, play, you could, you had to play anything and everything. And, and I was always interested in, in, in write my own tunes. Well, and you guys, from what I gather, you guys kind of broke a little bit more in, in Europe than you did here in the States, right? Yeah. Yeah. Around 2004, we, we made a record called post a wire mm-hmm. and, um, and we we had a guy that we met in Portland. They moved over to London, and he was a, a music industry kind of guy. And he figured out, uh, you know, how to get us over there. And and he made the record uh, work, and it did really well over there. Uh, for whatever reason, I I still don't understand. And then we start touring over there from 2004. Uh, well, I just got back from a tour a couple of days ago, but but Fontaine toured there for about 13 years, I think. Did your was your writing subsequently well received over there because of the the band being popular? Yeah, I think I think that's probably true. I mean, my books do okay over there, mm-hmm. and um uh and that probably has something to do with the band. I would guess. I, you know, I wouldn't have had anything without Richard Fontaine. That's for sure. Well, that was cause my kind of my next question was about your first your first book, The Motel Life, which came out in two thousand and six. Um, you know, if you're in the world of of music, I'm assuming there's not a ton of overlap between that and the world of literary fiction. And so, was were you just writing on the side, and it kind of all came about uh, that you got a novel published, or was it, you know, did somebody in the music industry like pass along your your, uh, your transcript to it? Like, how did that kind of come about for uh, you? Because we, you know, you always hear from writers like getting the first novel is like the hardest thing. Yeah, I mean, it is. I mean. You know, it, it was different for me uh, because I did all, you know, spent so many years in a band that I, you know, I started writing novels at uh, 19 just for fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, I didn't want to show anybody my novels and didn't really until I was 35 uh, because, you know, being in a band beats you up so much. There's so many ups and downs and in, in, in a struggling, you know, mom and pop band that I didn't want to subject uh, my novels to that at all so I kind of just wrote them as a hobby for fun and then when the band started doing better I was about 35 or so uh, um, someone because the band was doing better someone goes hey and they'd read my lyrics they go I bet you write novels and I said or short stories and I said yeah I write novels and uh, and then uh, so I met an agent through that so and then she was smart enough to sell the motel life so mm-hmm. I just got lucky that way, I didn't have to go through the the same avenue um, that that so many writers have to have the, to go the through the query so I, process. You know, yeah, I didn't have to go through that just because I I, I I I got lucky. I had the I had novels done at a time when you know the the five minutes that there was interest in me, I had a uh, I had a novel to hand to somebody. So I you know I had the books, but I, I got lucky. I know you uh, you write out of an office in Portland now, but you mentioned earlier doing a lot of writing out at Portland Meadows. Uh, that was kind of how I first got to meet you was uh, just you know announcing the races. And I remember I would hear about this like there's this writer guy that sits and writes his books at uh, at Portland Meadows. I think the Willamette Week did a story about it. And would you just literally set up your computer and have a beer and watch the simulcast, or was it live racing, or, or what was kind of the scene like then? I, I would do all of it. You know, this is uh, you know back when. I went through all the phases, right? Like we're right, you know. I was there when they still had the middle section of of the, the second level yeah. open, and um and so I started writing out there. I guess like ninety five, mm-hmm. ninety six. Um, uh, I just you know, there's big tables and no one's there, and um, <laughs> you can you can plug in your computer and sit at those tables, and you can drink coffee all day, 
And then when you get tired uh, of writing or you get stuck, you just bet a race or two, and then that that's, like, gives you a jolt, and uh, and then you go back to writing. And so I did that for, I guess I did that for about 10 years at least, uh, 15 years, 14 years, something like that. So I wrote, you know, I wrote a couple decent books out there and wrote uh, a couple failed ones. Um, so I did that. Yeah, I loved it. It was my favorite thing to do. And you uh, did, you dabbled in horse ownership a little bit, right? Well, no, I never bet. I, I own three horses now, and one's an old Portland Meadows uh, quarter horse uh, named a Meritable Dash. Yeah. Uh, Dash for Cash. Uh, Dash for Cash, grandson. He wasn't. He was the grandson. He wasn't fast, which I, <laughs> which I hate to tell him. But uh, once in a while, when he's being honorary, I have to tell him, "Well, look, man, you're the, you're the racehorse that's not fast, so you got to be cool to me." Uh, but uh, I bought him later on. But you know, I guess uh, about 2007 or eight, I, I, uh, I started getting these huge crushes on horses, and um, out there, and 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 I got you know I'd get crushes on jockeys and horses, and uh, and that's when I my handicapping kind of started faltering, and I started wondering about you know what happens to these horses that just suddenly disappear, and then what do you do with the a three thousand dollar race horse that's beat up, and uh, I just started thinking about that, and you know, thinking about how much money jockeys make and how dangerous it is, and you know, for a good ten years, I never thought of that yeah. sort of stuff, and I don't know what changed in me, but I just started, I started just falling in love with horses, and the crazy thing is, is I would do stuff like I always handicapped the night before, mm-hmm. and I'd make a few adjustments, but usually every Friday night I wouldn't go out, and I'd just spend all night handicapping. And then I'd go Saturday, and if I did good on Saturday, I'd spend all Saturday night handicapping for Sunday. And then, um, um, uh, but as time went on, you know, maybe 12 years in, I started seeing a horse. I'd fall in love with a horse in the paddock, and you know, a lot of most times I wouldn't even go to the paddock because it, it would always skew my betting. Sure. And uh, uh, but I started falling in love with like these 17 to one shots that have never won, and I'd go. I'd fall in love with it, just the face of the horse, and I'd end up putting a twenty, like a like a like a rookie, yeah. just putting money on these horses, just because I I was falling in love with them. So I knew something was wrong with me, uh, me and gambling, and me and and betting horses around that time, and that's kind of when I started lean on Pete as well. Yeah, and uh, for folks who don't know, Lean on Pete was a real horse at Portland Meadows. Dave Duke trained him, and uh, I got to announce him for a, a couple of years. And uh, I, I remember in the book. Or I think it's like even before they actually like it might be in the prologue or something. Like you mentioned that like the trainer in this book is nothing like Dave Duke, <laughs> the real trainer. Yeah, yeah, he was. A, you know, I didn't know the guy very well, but I'd uh-huh. met him and his wife, and and I asked him about if you know that I was going to n- name the book after his horse, and it, that it was a rough story, but it had nothing to do with him. I just love I love the name of it, and mm-hmm. um. Because in this in the novel, everybody does lean on Pete. I mean, they all lean on the horse for the kid leans on him for comfort. Uh, the trainer leans on him, of course, for to win to make money, and uh, and the jockey leans on him because the jockey needs to win. People bet on him, all that. But uh, but in in general, I bet I besides the name, I just he was one of those horses that I'd always win on. When I wouldn't bet on him, he would lose, and when I bet on him, he would win. And I have a picture by my my by my bed of, him, of me. I kind of photo bombed a win picture of of the day. I said, "Well, if, if he wins today, I'll name the book after him." And he he went off at like eleven to one, and I put a lot of money on him, and it was great. And, and he and he won. And so then I photo bombed. Uh, you can see my head sticking out in the in the win picture. In uh, in your various tours and travels, did you make it to a lot of uh, the race tracks? I mean, I always try to hit all the tracks uh, wherever I go. Uh, you know, I, I I made you know I vacation around tracks. Mm-hmm. So I did, and I always loved the West. So I go to all the tracks in the West um, that I could. And then if I was traveling, like if I go to New York, I'd go to like Aqueduct uh, if I could. Uh, um, and then you know when I was in Ireland, I would go to the Galway races. Uh, in Australia, I'd go to races. I'd go to races uh, whenever I could. Uh, back in the day. 
Willie Vaughn, our guest here on the Better America Radio Network. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, hitting up all the tracks in the West. Your books and movies, or your books and movies, books and uh, music, to me, are just littered with the West. And one of my favorite things is uh, all the random towns that get mentioned, like Winnemucca and Klatskanai and Spokane and stuff. Do you uh, do you think you'll ever write something that isn't set in the West, or is it just too much uh, a part of your experience? I mean, I guess you just write about what, what you're in love with, yeah. and um, I, I just like all those. Like, I love Winnemucca. <laughs> like, my mom would cry every time if, if, if we had to go to Winnemucca. She'd be just like, "Why do we have to go to Winnemucca?" Uh, uh, but I love, I love Winnemucca, and I love Elko. I love Northern Nevada, Eastern Oregon. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love so much. Uh, it just visually, they're just uh, incredible. So I guess if I get tired of them, I'll write about something else. Uh, the problem with me is that I, I'm pretty stubborn on things I like. I end up usually liking for a long time, but uh, but yeah, I I never think about uh, um, the, it, it in terms of that. I just start with being in a place and being in a place I love. And so when I started Lean on P, for instance, I you know I was in love with Portland Meadows, um, but I was having a problem with with horse racing. Me and horse racing were were breaking up in mm-hmm. a way, um, but I love Portland Meadows. Uh, uh, so, so that's why I said it there. I mean, my big dream in life was always to own that pink house that they tore down. But there's a pink house outside of Portland Meadows, and I thought, man, to live right next to Portland Meadows in that big house, uh, I, I, I feel like a king. Our uh, the Portland Meadows maintenance guy Gary, he still he lives in the house right behind the uh, back parking lot there. When you go onto the back stretch, he's lived there for like ten years now. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I, was used to I would him, love to live. I there. used to tell him, I said, "Man, you got the best commute to anybody in town." <laughs> yeah, I mean, I used to see those houses. I tried to, you know, where Lena and Pete, where the kid uh, lives, like when you go underneath the tunnel and you're on mm-hmm. the other side, and there's all those houses. I tried to buy a house there years before. I just never had enough money. Yeah, like when you're going to the Jubits. <laughs> I used to go. I used to yeah, go, yeah. There's that row yeah. of like real, real tiny houses, and uh-huh. I thought, well, I can afford one of these. And it turns out I couldn't. Yeah, I used to. Uh, the Jubits was my daily lunch spot for years during the summertime when there was nothing going on at the uh, at the track. Well, uh, Willie, I really appreciate you taking some time to join us uh, again. If folks want to check out your newest novel, don't skip out on me. It is out now for uh, Harper Perennial, and uh, folks can also go to WillieFlotten dot com. And uh, thanks so much, man. It was fun to catch up. Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, and um, uh, good luck on the races. All right. Willie Vlotten, our guest here on the Bet America Radio Network. We'll be right back after this short timeout.